So they're like, oh, I got this deal. It's sitting on someone's website for one. It's on some wholesaler's Excel sheet for two. And for three, the guy that's talking to me about it, like he's the listing broker, isn't. Somebody else is. And then you learn that they all know each other and you get different prices for the same property. So let me just tell newer people, all the same properties are all over the place. And the only way that you get any better is to build your reputation. That is it, period. To be at the top of the best brokers list. Once we went through a really difficult closing where most buyers would have backed out 10 times, we had so many reasons to back out and we still pushed forward and closed the deal. They were all over us. Welcome to the Lion's Den, the real estate podcast for perspicacious investors who know they have the strength to succeed in the lucrative commercial multifamily industry. Gain expert advice on your way to becoming a top performer. I'm your host, Adam Parrish. I have my three co-hosts, Donato Callahan, Fia Mosley, and Lisa L. Parrish. How's everybody doing? Good. Glad to be here. Great. Awesome. And our (laughs) word of the day is brought to you by Lisa. The word of the day is mitigate. Mitigate, meaning make less severe, serious, or painful. We use the word mitigate a lot in this business. We're always trying to mitigate risk. So I'm taking that one off the table. Great. It's the most normal way. word we've used so far. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. I'm kind of normal. Sorry. And the obstacle of today's episode is how do I reach top of the best brokers lists? And for the very first question for today, I'm going to go with Donato Callahan with how do you nurture your relationships with brokers and team members? I can sum this up very quickly. Value their time. Brokers have typically spent years curating connections to repeat sellers, property owners, and the relationships to make transactions smooth. And they only get paid when they close. Same same with us as syndicators. All the work they do up front is a calculation of a risk of I'm going to, am I going to spend three or four months with this potential buyer to get them to sell? And if they don't come to the closing table ready to go, I'm going to lose three or four months of work and have be out thousands of dollars. So with that, you have to respect their time. That is, do the homework so you can walk in the door asking the right questions. If you don't know how to ask the right questions, find someone who does and ask them the questions first. Understand that the brokers that you're working with are going to have a lot of people calling them, especially the very well-known brokerages in any major metropolitan area. Syndicators from across the U.S. are going to be calling the same person 40 to 50 times saying, hey, I want to make a connection. I want to start a relationship with you. So you need to be able to stand out. So for us, what I do, anytime FIA makes a broker connection and they start sending us some deals, first off, they usually tend to send us the the low brow stuff, looking to see if we actually know what we're talking about. Can we analyze the deal? Are we going to throw an offer out on anything? And what we'll do is we'll run the numbers on it. Every time, quick and dirty, what's the, what do the returns look like? What does the underwriting look like? Is a market meet our criteria? And if it doesn't, or if it does, we always write a two to three sentence paragraph that I then hand back to Fia that she can bring the broker and say, hey, thank you so much for giving us this deal. It does or does not meet our criteria for these reasons. We appreciate you sending it to our way. If the deal does work, hey, it looks like it meets our criteria. I have some follow-on questions for you. Or B, if it doesn't work, thanks for sending it our way. We appreciate it. We can't wait for the next one. And start proving to the brokers that if they take the time out of their day to send you inventory, that you respect their level of expertise and their time enough to actually put in work and truly analyzing a deal. You do that for a year and a half, show that you're not going anywhere. Eventually, they'll start giving you better inventory, better inventory. And when they do find finally send you something that is worth your while, you've shown that you have the capacity to respect their time. You're going to ask questions that matter, and you're working to getting them closed. And the more you can keep that in the back of your mind, that is, hey, broker, I want to get you paid. I want to make sure that you walk away from closing table with a nice check. They're going to like you better. They're going to like you better. So end of the day, respect their time, be efficient, communicate with them 
whether a deal does or does not work for you and then be consistent. All right, great. And next one is for Bia mostly. Mm -hmm. What is your experience on pursuing to be top of mind to your brokers? One thing I love about our team is we have like different perspectives on life and, you know, everything Donato just said is so legitimate. Um, I had a totally different frame of mind when we started in this business a year and a half ago and being a little bit older, trying out all these jobs and careers to where, you know, I'm looking for things that are meaningful to me and fulfillment in my life. And it's more than just a business money thing. So I felt like I had some stuff on my heart that was really important to me, like working with younger people. And there's, like he said, there's so many people coming at these same people. What makes you any different from them? I do, I would say that Donato and Quinn's skills are really good. So we do have that, but there's a lot of people out there with great skills. So I always would try to talk to people about just things that were meaningful to me and really getting to know them as a person personally. And it does take time. And I didn't understand even really the language of multifamily when I started. So it's just being in there for the long run. After a while, like somebody I had talked to for half of a year, like, oh, he's 25. He wrestled in college. Oh, this one's 26. He's from Miami. It just, it, all that stuff takes time because they have so many people calling them. So for me, I was trying to find brokers or partners or people that were also looking to do something more meaningful besides for just make money, also challenge themselves and expand and be problem solvers together and learn and grow. So anyway, hopefully that's not too much of a rant, but I went about the whole relationship thing more from the angle of, okay, this is what's meaningful to me. This is what I'm trying to create and getting to know them as a person. And it's taken time for sure. Okay. Lisa, what did you do to get to the top of the best brokers lists? So we started out just like most students trying to figure out the best way to get deals, whether it would be through brokers or going direct to seller. You know, there's some great opportunities that you can create, creative financing, you know, going directly to seller when you're working on smaller deals. But once you're ready to go probably 80 units plus, those are the more savvy sellers. And those sellers are going to be working with brokers. I've been a real estate broker for 20 years and just, I know getting in their head and how they think. And like Donato pointed out, they don't get paid. They don't get paid for a lot of the work that they do. And the only time that they're going to get paid is if they close the deal. So they're testing you, always testing you. And that rapport that you have with the broker right off the beginning, right from the beginning, it's very important. I tell students that they want to practice, maybe practice on a market that they probably don't plan on working on in because it takes some time. If you've never talked to a broker before, you're going to be nervous and you want to practice and get your speech together and come off strong right off the beginning. And my, in my opinion, and what we did was... The sooner that you can get face-to-face -face with a broker, the sooner that you can build that rapport. And Fia can attest to this. You can build rapport over the phone. During COVID, we had no choice to do that. You can build rapport over Zoom. That's how, you know, better. But honestly, the soon as you, sooner that you can actually go to lunch with them, maybe even have a drink with them, depending on if they're the kind of broker that wants to have a drink or dinner. And that's really where we had our big break was we started going to lunch and dinner with, and we were locals. And when you're local and you're doing it in your backyard, you can really build rapport and become friends with your brokers. And that, I mean, our big break came from going out for drinks with broker and the broker told us that he had gotten a big opportunity to have a big listing. And it was our, it was going to be our first big break. <laughs> and, you know, we, he, the broker knew that we were going to be able to get the deal closed. It's all about showing the broker, proving to the broker that they can trust you, that you and your group is going to, are going to be closers. And really the only way to prove that is to close a deal. So your first deal is about closing. You don't want to be a pain in the butt. You never want to be a pain in the butt, but really your first deal is proving that you are, that you are going to be easy to work with, that you're going to do what you say you're going to do, that you're not playing games. There's a lot of buyers that will come in and they might have the best offer. They might 
even give the best terms and the highest price, but they're known for being a pain in the butt to work with. And unfortunately it shouldn't work this way. It should just be all about what's on paper to what's the seller, but I've seen it happen many times. Brokers are influenced to the seller, to the buyer, and they don't want to work with someone who's going to be difficult to work with. And they will let the sellers know this. I've seen it happen. Make it easy to work with. And then our sellers got, or our brokers got to the point where they knew that we negotiated hard up front because we were serious and we didn't like to play games. And then once we were done negotiating, that was it. This is the deal. Unless something really major happens that changes the deal. This is the deal and this is closed. And our brokers would say that. We know when Lisa's in, she's in, it's closed. They didn't never had to worry about what was going to happen later. That's the secret right there. So many good points in there. <laughs> I do appreciate you bringing up the whole broker or direct to seller thing, because I think this is geared towards newer people coming into whether it's a different education system or a mentor or whatever. And I think that is a thing. Some people think, oh, I should go straight to the seller. And nobody really says anything like you just said, like, oh, okay, well, that's fine. You know, you have 30 units, whatever, or why, like why you want to work with the listing broker or different people. Do you want to work with wholesalers? Like there's kind of this whole confusion yeah. around starting on who you actually want to work with. So I appreciate like a little bit of separating. Context, there. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it depends on what you're looking at. The smaller properties are going to have mom and, many times going to have mom and pop owners and those mom and pop owners, like we bought a 29 unit in Charlotte off of this older couple. This is a very common story. They worked their butts off, made a bunch of money, retired and, or, and all their savings and everything, took their savings and bought an apartment complex and thought that they could just live off of the cash flow, but then realized, oh, this is work. <laughs> and you actually have to go out and collect rents and all that kind of stuff. So we came in and actually kind of saved them from that. But creative financing happens a lot more often in the smaller properties because of those mom and pops that they don't really know to go to the broker or you know how to approach that. So as a buyer, you have the opportunity, you can be creative, you can go direct to seller and make some creative deals happen. Madonna, it looked like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to comment on how everything Lisa's saying, it's about what your time horizon is. If you're going to be in this business for a long time, and if you're going into this business, you should plan on being in it for several decades. Focusing on the 15 to 25 year time horizon is going to be infinitely more valuable than focusing on the one to three year time horizon. It will dynamically shift how you approach brokers, how you approach negotiations, how you approach building your reputation. Because ideally, at some point, you all have been doing this for 15 or 20 years. You have five brokers that will swear by your work ethic, that know you can get closed. And all the pocket listings that right now as a young student are so frustrating you're not getting because you haven't proved yourself yet. Eventually, you're the one getting all the pocket listings because you've proven yourself and you have the best inventory, the best opportunities, and you have your pick of the litter. And focusing on building a foundation that can support your aspirations to that 20-year, 25-year time horizon will fundamentally affect how you make decisions now in your business. So I think Lisa's spot on and I would encourage all students, think further, look down the road, see what's coming, accommodate for that. Absolutely. Okay. And then I'll ask via a quick question too. What partners do you need on your team? Yeah, we've talked about this a little bit before. A lot of people have different models. I can only speak for us. When we, when we got in, I saw, and we were all separate. So just talking about me right now, I saw these things like underwriting. You can't do a deal without underwriting it and making a business plan. So what are those starter things? Building a website to me isn't a starter thing, but maybe it is to other people. So finding the deals. Okay. I don't know why to tell you the truth, but I thought brokers, I never thought, oh, I'm going to go reach out to sellers. And honestly, that's not true. It could also be because we don't live in our target market. That's one thing about what Lisa was saying is if I was down in the Dallas area, I'd be going to meetups every single week. I would be meeting brokers every single week. I would know the area inside and out like I do here. And that's just not the case. So it takes a little bit longer, but um, I totally lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? 
What partners do you need on your team? I'm just glad that doesn't just happen to me. (laughs) Who you need on your team? Okay, yes. You heard it here first. She's human. She's human. (laughs) Oh my God. Everybody who works with me knows this. I'm like, wait, what was I talking about again? I love Um, it when that happens to anyone else but me. Deal sourcing, you got to give it to an underwriter and then... We're fortunate to have roles like Donato and Manny and Maudi as well, but Donato and Manny doing comps and really researching the area around each apartment complex. So to me, you start with the basic stuff, like you need someone to call a broker, you need someone to underwrite a deal to find the comps to make, and then you grow from there, like asset management, say for example, right? Like, why are you thinking about that when there's no asset? It's great to have that idea that you want to do that. I personally never thought, but to start out with, you have to just be able to make a simple business plan. And then, and every role is so important. It's so important. I look at the load Quinn has as an underwriter and the things Donato does to go into that underwriting. And it's just, if it's not crucial, leave it alone at the beginning. That's my opinion, personally. I agree with you on that. I see a lot of students that are, and Ryan and Tyler might disagree with me on this, but that really, that are focusing on their website and their business cards. And I get all that, that is that stuff is important. You definitely need to have a business name and business cards, but focus too much on that stuff when you really should be focusing on contacting brokers and getting deals in, getting that deal flow in. And if you have the right people and the right strategies going on, you really could be doing that simultaneously. But I just, I I wouldn't want to stall your business for two or three months while you're getting all that stuff together. That's two or three months you could actually be getting a deal. And we had all the people for that. Manny did a lot on the website. That was one thing about having maybe what people thought were more people. I don't think that's more people anymore. I think this is a very big workload. And if you don't have that on your team, you're just going to bring it in with partners anyway. You're going to have to get all the work done. How many people does that take? Two? No. Not at all. Three? No, not even the four of us. We would need like all these other people to complete a deal if we're all being real. Yeah, I think the base, the basics. And then when you're trying to figure out what you want to do, like for me with the broker relationships, I think it's very simple. You're either spreadsheets, numbers, or you're a people person. So I had two choices, capital raising or brokers. And I went the route that I did for a reason. I wanted to create a whole team and a system and expand. I wanted to expand, build something eventually that's more than just our team, like maybe our team and then grow it out. But anyway, that's a rant, I think. So, (laughs) so yeah, using mushy words too. That's another thing. Like when you talk to people, they'll say something like, oh, I want to do capital raising, but I do acquisitions. I don't know what any of that means. What exactly are you doing practically on a day-to-day basis? And I think that gets specific when you're brand new. Are you making a phone call to a broker or capital raising or underwriting? Like they're all mushed together in a lot of conversations. And Lisa, I'll just follow up with a similar question, slightly different. What other brokers and team members do you need on your team? Did you want me to say what not to do? That was... One of my questions. Yeah, you can Yeah, do that right now. What okay. not to do. Okay, let me touch on what not to do on, with brokers. What not to do, and I've, I'm bringing this up because I've actually seen it happen often. You don't want to do something that would could be considered a bribe to brokers. And I've seen a lot of people do this where they will actually give a kickback. If you give me this deal, I'll give you a kickback. And I think a lot of people maybe think like, how can I get these brokers to like me? Um, but you want to make sure that you're not doing something because if the broker does accept it, he could lose his license, he or she, but there are ways that you definitely can same thing with like title companies to a realtor. They can wine and dine you. You can definitely take your brokers out for dinner, lunch or whatever. And for some reason that's in the middle where you can do that and get away with it. And it's not a bribe, but don't give kickbacks. I'm just bringing it up because I've seen it happen. That's so funny. I never would have thought of that. And yeah, yeah being, <laughs> that's so interesting. Being, pre- being prepared. I know I've been in some really uncomfortable positions as a newer person, even switching sponsors when you're turning in an LOI, like things, decisions you just have to make because 
maybe it's not moving. Oh, okay, we're going to submit this offer and nothing's moving. So what's going to happen once you close on the deal if you're already not working together? But the point being is being prepared as much as you can ahead of time with the broker so you don't have to back out of things. Like I intentionally would not go submit an LOI without a sponsor's backing right now because there's a high likelihood I would have to back out after I scramble around for a long time looking for a sponsor last second. And then do you want to answer the question of what, what are brokers and team members? For me? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to need, besides your real estate broker, and that was mainly what we were talking about. You're also going to need a mortgage broker or a few mortgage brokers. We typically like to have at least two or three, one that specializes in agency loans like Freddie and Fannie Mac, we use CBRE. And then one that specializes outside of that, like bridge debt or creative financing, more creative financing, and sometimes bank loans as well. And then you're going to need an insurance broker. We used Nico, you guys have probably met Nico. We used him for years. And recently we switched to Cameron Stewart. We like to have one insurance broker because you're not really going to use multiple insurance brokers to shop each other. Um, your insurance broker, you find one good one and he will shop for you all the different insurance companies. And then you're going to need one attorney that at least what this is what we do is we have one attorney that she does. She's our general attorney if we have any kind of an issue. And she also writes all of our contracts. Doesn't matter where we're buying. She writes the contract or works with the other, with the seller or buyer, the other party's attorney to finish the contract. She does it no matter what state. And then if it is a state where you have to have an attorney close the deal, she'll work with an attorney. She'll hire someone that can close the deal. She'll work with that attorney. And if it's a title state where we don't need to have an attorney, then she'll work with a title company to close it. And then you'll need an SEC attorney that handles all of your securities and exchange and your PPM, all that, and also will help keep you compliant, SEC compliant. You'll need property inspectors. And if you're buying in one particular area, like for us, we like to buy a monopoly. We like to buy in a portfolio. So a lot of times we already have the inspector we've already used, or we'll use our property management company's inspector, internal inspector, and maybe hire some external that we haven't fully covered, but you'll need that in each market, a property inspector, and you'll need a property management company. Some management companies only do one area. Some are much bigger and will grow with you or move into new areas, but you want to definitely have a good property management company. That's huge. Probably the one of the biggest ones. We all know property management is the key to the success of this business. And then you're going to need contractors in each market as well, post-closing. And if it's a lot of rehab, you know, if it's a big repositioning project, you might even need a project manager. We've actually hired that before. Someone that someone that's in between your asset manager and your contractors, because the asset manager is only going to do so much as far as, you know, babysitting the contractors. If it's a big project, you're going to want someone hired. And I think that's about it that I could think of. I don't Everyone know, listening wrote everybody. all of that down. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of a lot of moving parts for sure. And that's where a great sponsor yeah. can help because a fantastic sponsor will know a lot of those people. So you can specialize on what you do, what you know, and they can have what they know, and you can come together and makes a much more efficient system. So I'd say yeah. also with that, don't look to reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. If you know someone who is already super skilled and has these amazing relationships with all these people you need, and you can come in and you can fit your spoke in that wheel and help supplement that process, do it. Be value add. If you try your best to remove the vanity in that I have to create something new just to be able to say I created something new, if your overall goal is to be successful in the business. And that's where I think, now I'm going to go on a rant. That's where I think some people in overall in business have problems. They're going into business to fulfill the sense of I started a business, look at my branding, look at my marketing. I'm just out here looking like I have a business because I want the feelings that come with appearing successful. Whereas if you're saying, what's my goal? My goal is to close multifamily deals and gain wealth. Okay. Sometimes the best answer isn't doing everything on your own. In fact, sometimes the best answer can be finding a successful operation, making it more efficient, smoother, faster, easier for everyone else, taking on that workload and coming together to create something bigger than yourself that works for everyone. So reassess priorities, 
understand that if you're creating something new, there better be a good damn reason that you're making something from brand new from scratch. If you don't have a good reason for it, it's a vanity project. You need to reassess your priorities. Dropping my cigar. That's what I have to say. Oh, <laughs> I agree. Cigar I agree. drop. I know. Yeah. That's why people that you work with are so important. I've learned this business is just one. Okay. You like, you have one obstacle. You got past that. There's another one. You got past that. So if you're already going up a hill, you don't want to work with people that make it feel like you have rocks thrown in your face down the hill and you can be solution finders or problems finders. I don't know. Anyways, but that's one thing, you know, about our team that I feel like is really good is we're solution. I'm not to the point where, oh, we have this terrible underwriting. Now we're going to figure out how to make it work. No, like it has to make sense to start with, but then you will hit like all these obstacles. And if you have the right people, they can, I don't want to say criticize, but pick things apart, but there's always a solution. It's all going in the same direction. And that's really important. I think our team's really good at that. Don't you feel like you're playing a video game sometimes though, where somebody is always throwing stuff at you and you have to be blocking it and just trying to figure out how to get to the other side and but you can't just stop and wait and you have to keep going through it. And you're trying and to sometimes mitigate the harder problems. it is though. Here's the word. Trying to mitigate Mitigate. problems. This is kind of like classic Donkey Kong, right? You're climbing the ladders. You got barrels rolling down at you. You can stand still and get smushed, or you can hop the barrel, keep climbing to the next problem, have more hurdles, jump over those, literally, playing Donkey Kong, keep climbing until you get the property at the top. Simple. And do it all over again with (laughs) with different problems. I, you know, I definitely, Quinn was saying this too. Our second property has actually been much harder working on it, working the whole process has been much harder than the first. And it's funny, you know, I was all excited about the laws of the first deal, like, oh, it's just gonna, you're gonna go into the second one. And that's been challenging, but I always have to remember like growth and expansion, like we're hitting all these obstacles right now that would we would not have bettered our underwriting or our relationships or our systems if we weren't being hit in the face trying to walk up the hill at the moment and then donato i had one more question and you sort of already touched on this a little bit but do you have anything else to add on what ways do you help your team that relates to brokers yeah making sure they sound competent (laughs) and making sure everyone knows talking talking about about me And like part of the answer is, like I said earlier, brokers have highly valuable time, especially if they do a lot of transactions, they have a lot of connections. And so when it comes to Fia and she's talking to brokers, I want her to be able to walk into any conversation and know exactly why we like this or don't like this. So she can have informed, well-educated conversations regarding this specific entity. Because typically when it comes to brokers, we're going to be talking to potentially 10 different people, 10 different properties. And I consider it my job to get information organized and say, okay, this is the Sandy Oasis in this area. Here's the build year. Here's the loss to lease. Here's what I found on their T12 and their OM. Here's all the questions that I have from a DD perspective. Via here's this list in a, in a nice curated environment. You can take this. You can get answers to these four questions and you can speak to get see what they're thinking about these three things in the om that would get us the plan b and we can go great got it you can go to the broker and she can have these informed decisions and also build the relationship on the personal side then the broker knows that while fia is able to invest in the personal relationship building like where do you go to school how do you get to being a broker she can also speak to the fact that we have a professional educated background of why we're having this conversation we're not just shooting the shit we're also asking the questions we need to get the transaction done so I help my team in making sure the research is done, that they can go out and talk to their counterparts and keep moving this, the needle forward and represent our team well. So what he's saying too, you know, I, I always thought about this, okay, me and all these people going to this broker, and let's just be real, none of us know what we're talking about when you're a month into a whole new industry with new terminology and all that, you can study your brains out, okay, but when people see their phone ring, do they like, do they want to talk to you? That's the thing. Do they enjoy it? Is it funny? Is it fun? Or you do, you know, is it just, oh, checking in? Do you have any listings for me or something like that? Whatever. I don't know what people say, honestly, 
but it, do they enjoy talking to you? Because there's not a whole lot that's going to set you apart at the beginning when nobody knows what they're really doing. You're going off of some education script or something or what you're told you should do. So, you know, do they enjoy your company? I think is a big deal. And then the final thing I want to touch on buyers brokers and avoiding working with them, working straight with the <clears throat> listing broker when you can oh. to mit mitigate issues when going through your due diligence process and working up to getting under contract. Yeah, you know, it really grinds yeah. my gears. Oh, brother. <laughs> there was a deal. Fia knows this deal. It is Victorian Village in St. Louis. It's 232 unit complex we we're working on about a year ago. This was, for our listeners out there, this was the one that got away. This is the one that you took to senior prom and 15 years later, see you walking past the mall and you're just like, wow, if only. Victorian Village, we wanted bad. We wanted real bad. We wanted this deal more than anything. Our entire team's hearts were set on it. And we had a several brokers involved in the transaction. There's a listing agent and there's the buyer's broker. And I found that the when I went to do a walkthrough, I would be asking the property manager direct questions about the occupancy, the turnover, if she could fix any five problems with the complex, what would she fix immediately with an unlimited budget, seeing what her insights were. And as I'm speaking to this person, the buyer's broker, who's supposed to be working for us, is writing down answers and questions like, oh, it's a good question. I should ask that next time. <laughs> that is a completely useless role to be filling. <laughs> if you are our representation and you are learning things while I am having this conversation with the management, either you don't know the asset well enough or you shouldn't be representing this. You shouldn't be representing this deal. So when it comes to buyers brokers, you know, some are as simple as I have a list of 50 properties across the US and they're like, maybe they're off market and so they operate like a residential wholesaler. And so they'll send you the information and tack on a one to 3% transaction costs. So just for sending you an Excel list, they want 3% of maybe a $10 million deal. And you go, absolutely not. But when it comes from an operation side, if it's someone in between you, the more people between you and the seller, the more convoluted it gets. That's this, you play the telephone game, right? Where you have to whisper something to someone and then it keeps going, it keeps going. All of a sudden the message gets completely lost. The more people between you and your seller, the more opportunities there are for miscommunication and the breakdown in the relationship that could eventually get you the deal. So buyers, brokers, if you're going to work with one, and I think everybody on this call is going to say, don't. <laughs> if you're going to work with one, ensure that they have your interests at heart, ensure that they have the right questions to ask, ensure they have experience, ensure that they're going to actually provide value as opposed to here's the transaction. I did my part and then sit back. Make check their value add. Ensure they have value add bringing to the platform and the overall transaction. And if you are going to work with them, it's nicer if you can just be able to speak directly to the listing agent. And I think the more experienced you get, I'm sure the parishes will speak more on this later. It's nice to be able to go directly to the listing agent and just ask your questions and go directly to the seller. Because you, you really want as few cooks in the kitchen as possible when you're doing a transaction this big. And Lisa already said, all those people that are involved in a transaction to make it work if you can have fewer people that aren't 100% critical to the transaction working in the transaction, you're going to have a sm easier, smoother time. Second rant of the day over. I'm just fired up today. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> that was excellent. Lisa, do you Lisa want taught us. Lisa, that was from Lisa. Or Lisa taught us that. So yeah, oh, I don't know if she That's has all... more that she wants to add to that. He said everything I wanted to say, so... My <laughs> took her thunder over there. Yeah. No, I remember specific things that we've learned from Lisa that seemed a complete no brainer that I was just like, oh, why why does nobody talk about that? I need to start making a little book with Lisa. I think, I think there's things. some people that disagree and that's fine. It, you know, there's different everyone had has a different perspective and a different a different view on it based on experiences that they've had. I was a broker. And so if you're, this is even in residential, it's just, it's human nature that when you're listing a property in residential, it's more common that people work with buyers brokers. That is a, it's pretty much just, that's what people do. So as a listing broker, you expect that you're going to be sharing your commission and it's very common, but every once in a while you do get lucky and you're able to get capture your own buyer and take both sides of the deal. That's really 
that's what that's what a lot of times listing brokers are thinking in residential is you go into the commercial world and the commercial world especially when the big with the bigger properties and you guys have noticed this they have their own by any good broker good listing broker has their own buyer pool and they really go to their buyer pool and they really don't work with other brokers is is very uncommon and so if you have a buyer's broker you hire someone and a lot of times they try to get you to sign an exclusive with them and then you go they find the deal for you you do feel that the value there's value in the fact that they found you the deal and that's the argument is that they went out and found the deal for us and that's great but if you have a great relationship with brokers that list deals they'll find you the deal and they'll list it themselves so i had some really great brokers with cushman and wakefield where they felt like we knew they knew that we could buy the deal and they would shake down the sellers for us of big deals. And we were able to find some of the best deals that way where they listed the, because they already had the buyer available. But like Donato said, the more brokers that you have involved, not only is the more convoluted the conversations are and the harder it is to get to the seller, but the commission, let's face it, the, the brokers are working for money. And if they have to share the commission, either they have to share their commission or you have to pay it out of pocket. Either one is not a good solution in my opinion. So if maybe when you first get started, if you have a buyer's broker that doesn't have his own listings and you feel the only way that you're going to get to a broker, maybe there's a use for it. Okay. But it really shouldn't be the normal. The normal should be you make relationships with brokers who list properties. I got to the point where I would, a broker would call me because you do get your name out there and you'll have brokers actually calling you. The broker would call me and say, Hey, I have this blah, blah, blah. And I would say, are you actually the listing broker? And a lot of times they would say, no, I just know of the deal. So they would be going, they would either be charging me for their commission, so I can, they're not doing it for free, or they would be asking the listing broker for part of its their commission or both. Either one is not a good solution. The best way is to go direct to seller. I love going direct to seller because there's no one in the middle. Less, less commission, obviously, but it's not really about the commission. It's about being, if you can negotiate directly with the seller, you can be more creative. You can get to the heart of what the seller really wants. One broker in the way is too much. And even then I try to get on a call with the seller so that I can actually have a conversation. Broker always wants to be there, but at least then you can get a conversation going. Two brokers though, yeah, it's very difficult because it, it they're all about themselves and getting the deal. And if they're getting the deal done, maybe they want to bring you together. A good broker wants to do that. They want to bring everyone together and just get the deal done. Yeah. Anything to add before trivia time? Anybody else? They all have the same deals. That's what I want to add. The whole this is what yes. I learned last. This yes. is what I learned last year yes. oh, in Texas. Man. Okay, not just in Texas, but I can speak for Texas. The wholesalers, whoever the buyers brokers are, I don't know. I've always talked to Marcus and Millichap and groups like that, and then the listing brokers all have the same properties. And so they're like, mm -hmm. oh, I got this deal. It's sitting on someone's website for one. It's on some wholesaler's Excel sheet for two. Mm -hmm. And for three, the guy that's talking to me about it, like he's the listing broker, isn't. Somebody else is. And then you learn that they all know each other and you get different prices for the same property. Right now, exactly. there's a property yep. in Waco for sale that's off market that we looked at multiple times last year. So let me just tell newer people, that's a <laughs> load of shit. All that stuff is a load of shit. All the same properties are all over the place. And the only way that you get any better is to build your reputation. That is it, period. To be at the top the of the best, deal. to be at the top of the best brokers list is just what this is called. Because if you have the best brokers, it took me a while to get to that point where the Cushman and Wakefield, the best broker in South Carolina, the first time, couple of times I called him or even met with him to go see a tour, he was really rude. He was really standoffish. He barely even wanted to take my call. He wouldn't even look at us. He would just totally blow us off. Once we went through a really difficult closing where most buyers would have backed out 10 times, we had so many reasons to back out and we still pushed forward and closed the deal. They were all over us, all over us. Just like the things that you can, the reputation that you can build with these brokers and what, how you can prove yourself is absolutely endless. For sure. And I, yeah, I know exactly what deal you're talking about. We in, with that so deal, many. guys, we had wholesalers send it to us. 
We had a broker call us and say it was off market. Another broker actually listed on their website and they all had different whisper prices. I'm like, what's the right answer then? And then you call someone, we call one of our guys and say, hey, the deal you just told me about that's off market is listed on this guy's website. What's the deal? They're like, oh, yeah, that's just them. What do you mean it's just them? Oh, that's what they do. Like, I don't, who am I supposed to trust here? And pro tip, if you have multiple brokers send you the same transaction, and let's say they're all respected brokers, like they're Mark Similichap or Christian Wakefield and respected brokers, you have to be able to make a decision on who you're going to work with. And the, I'm just, I want to post this to everyone here to see if you guys agree. Work with the first person who brought it to you, who has, who is a respected professional in the industry. So if it's a wholesaler, no, no, not counting. But if you have like three different people bring you a deal, ideally, right, you have one listing agent and you have, it's only one person to work with. But if you have three people and there, there is a buyer's brokers and let's say they're all actually worth their time, work with the first one. Don't cherry pick best you can, unless someone has like an absolutely terrible reputation and they aren't going to work with you professionally. But we've had that situation a few times with us in AMF. Where we've had a couple of people bring us a deal on the buyer broker side. We were first getting started and we would say, Hey, thank you so much for bringing this deal to our attention. We've actually already been notified about it by this, by another agency. So out of respect for who brought it to us first, we're going to pursue it with them. We appreciate it bringing it to you. And it seems like a small thing, but it builds a reputation of, hey, we're going to work with the person who brings it to us first. We're not going to bounce between people. We're not going to pit people between each other. It's just a nice trusting thing because then that person, if you are going to work with the buyer's broker, knows, okay, so if I'm the first person to bring it to them next time, they'll work with me. And it builds that trust and it builds the credibility of you and your team. But ideally, you're just talking to the listing agent and there's only one person actually has the deal. That's the ideal scenario. I want to put that out there for the team, see what you guys think. Yeah, brokers, I agree. I agree with what you're saying. Brokers should, any ethical broker should even ask that question or find out if you've already seen the deal because they don't want to be competing. They should not be competing with each other. There's always competition to get a listing. But if there's someone else who's already brought you the deal, it just I feel like it's not really an ethical thing for them to be poaching you on a deal that, you, that you already know about. And a good broker is also going to have you sign a CA, a confidentiality agreement. And that also proves that they're the first ones to show it to you. So if you sign that, you really can't work with another broker. But I do agree with you. I think that showing brokers loyalty is huge. Another thing to add on to that is that once you get going and then you go to sell your properties, unless there's some reason not to, I always go to the broker that sold it to me to have them list it. And when they see that, you know, at one point we had three different listings with three different brokers because three different brokers had sold them to us. And each of them knew about the other, but they all knew the reason that they weren't listing the property. And they respect that, like you said, honesty and integrity of you, list, you sell the property to me, you get the listing a few years later. And, they, and on those big deals, that's huge. That's a whole nother deal that they don't have to farm and work toward. They just know they're going to get that listing someday. Yeah. Trivia time! Ooh, 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 ooh. Let's do it. According to smartasset.com, <laughs> for the 2023 tax year, what U.S. state has the highest capital gains tax rate? Oh, that's like taxes in 2022, but you're going to file them and actually pay them in 20. California. Yeah, I feel ooh, I feel like I feel like California is the easy choice here. I know. Maybe Illinois, maybe New York, but I feel like if we're going to I'll dump on California. I'll jump that train. Do the timer I'll say you. California. Okay. Do you? Idaho. Ohio. Idaho. Okay, that was fast. Wait, so Lisa said California? That was it? Yeah. Okay, it was California. Yeah. This is just an extension. I was trying to be different, okay? <laughs> That's fine. I would have done a follow-up question if everyone said California. California has rates that reach as high as 13.3%, and it depends on how much you're making. If you're a single person yeah. making above $600,000 in capital gains. And second, specifically for capital gains, was New Jersey and Washington, D.C. And I have one more tax question. According to smartasset.com, there are nine states with no state personal income tax. Write down the nine states you think are correct. Whoever gets the most states right wins. Ooh. If you have a paper right next to you, if not, got it. remember it. Aww. Got it. Ain't no thing. Oh my gosh. 
Oh my gosh, I don't know. You got nine options. Whoever gets the most right wins. Oh, geez. Oh, uh, I'm at four. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> The the same. Down. I'm really mad at you right now, Adam. Oh, uh, shoot. Dang it. Thank you. So you must always be prepared. <laughs> be prepared with what? Paper. I know, just uh, random and information. And random information. I think I got six. So you got a little more time. And this doesn't mean these are the best states for taxes. It's simply personal income tax and like capital gains. Yeah. I don't know this. Time is up. Okay. I think I, I, think I got that. six. I think I got okay. six. Maybe. Lisa, you have seven? Right. I think. I don't know. I don't, I don't okay. think I'm right. Okay. But let's do the easy it. ones. Like in Texas. Texas. <laughs> Florida. Yeah. Florida. Wyoming. I think Montana. Ar Arizona. Well, Arizona. One person at a time. Oh, oh okay. The Donato. Okay, I had Texas, Florida, Wyoming, Montana, Nevada, Arizona, I think. I have Texas, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Wyoming. I don't know why I wrote down Delaware, like just very randomly in the... <laughs> One of the pro Anyways. LLC states, in addition to Wyoming, it's a state that a lot of people register out of. Okay, so That's I have true. the same stuff except for that one. So it's all the same yes. as who? Oh, Wyoming, Nevada, Florida, Delaware. I didn't come up with that much. Okay, Donato won. The answers are Alaska, Florida, Nevada, South Carolina, or South Dakota, not South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee as of this year, Texas, Wyoming, Washington and New Hampshire are like, or tricky ones that they don't have any personal income tax. Washington does levy capital gains tax on high income earners and New Hampshire taxes investment earnings, but not earned wages. Okay. Right. So Montana and Arizona are on the list. Okay. I'll take four That's, to nine. I think Woo! they have low taxes though. I hear Alaska has a, a very high sales tax though. So it's not a, even really that. Like they get I just it's either high Alaska. sales tax or a high gasoline and cigarette tax or a high property tax. I'll get you somehow. Okay. And then final question. According to macrotrends.com, gold and platinum hit new all-time highs in 2008 with gold at $1,023 and platinum at $2,273. As of right now today, March 5th of 2023, gold is at a spot price of $1,856. What is the spot price of platinum right now? Okay, you said that you said platinum peaked at what? 2000? Uh, no, right now. In 2008, it hit an at the time high for it of 2,273. Okay, I'm going to guess 2,542. It's funny, I was going to say 2,500 when you were talking earlier. Let's go with 2450. 2656. Remember, gold is at 1856 right now. So the current spot right. price for platinum is $978. Oh, oh whoops, we went the wrong Ooh. way. I thought oh, it was well. more. No, it's not. Everybody thinks it's more, but it's like half the price. It used to be more. It used oh, to be more. Wow. Wow. Okay, interesting. On our apartment complexes, then, do we need to change the platinum? The gold, the gold is the top one now, and platinum's second. No, price. people still yeah. think it's platinum. But... <laughs> It's all about the air. It's all about the Middle Eastern yeah, yeah. Uh, strategy there with the gold colors. Okay. Anyone have anything else to add? I think I'm the only one who used the word of the day. I know. Oh, <laughs> mitigate. I think we use that so often in our day to day when it comes I was, to mitigating. I was trying to think of how to use the word in anything other than mitigating risk for something. That's like the only way you can really use the word. When it comes to what we're doing, like you rewrite your underwriting so many times, you you know, everything when it comes to your financial overview, when it comes to your walkthroughs and your due diligence, everything's just about mitigating overall. Yeah, it's all about mitigating risk. And that's really when it comes to multifamily investing, that is you how can, we have to look at that word. You can mitigate insults 
by just being nice to people. True, yeah. Look at that. People. Little, yeah. A little ray of sunshine in today's podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Lion's Den podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, make sure to leave us a like, subscribe, and share with anyone you think can gain value from today's podcast. What obstacles are you facing? Let us know in the comment section and we'll get to it in a future episode. If you're interested in passively investing with us, you can go to am-multifamily.com or you can email Fia at am-multifamily.com. Those links will be in the show description along with the Lion's Den Facebook page and website. Thank you. And have Roar in day.